Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have a video for you where I wanted to go through the kind of top 10 most common mistakes I see people making when they first start using Airflow so that you can avoid them. Um, so the goal here is just kind of showing you all the bad practices that you can do um, to screw up your DAGs, to use Airflow inefficiently, um, and show you how you can avoid doing those things to make sure that you're starting to design your pipelines uh, the right way, or you have some ideas for ways you can go back and optimize and refactor maybe your pipelines to make sure that you are following best practices and make sure that your pipelines are running as efficiently as possible. You know, best practices are just really pointless guidelines unless they have an objective. And that's always our objective is just making sure your pipelines and airflow environment are running as efficiently as possible. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon to uh, access my videos up to a week early and request custom videos as well. Um, but without further ado, let's get into it. So the first mistake I see people use, you know, or do when they start using Airflow is really trying to perform heavy transformation within Airflow directly. Um, you know, while Airflow does have a Python native execution engine, it, and, you know, it is able to do a lot of, of transformations, doing it at scale in Airflow is never really the best idea. Um, and so what I'll show you here, and uh, just, you know, kind of bring you up a clean uh, Python file to show you these examples is, this is an example of something you wouldn't want to do, right? Doing your aggregations directly within uh, directly within Airflow, right? You know, doing things like aggregations or heavyweight transformations where, you know, this could be something that is occurring, you know, on a data set that's, you know, over a few megabytes in size or even gigabytes, right? Really gigabyte out and up is where you're really gonna wanna move this off of Airflow. And think about using other engines like Spark in conjunction with Airflow to do the heavyweight processing, um, but only using them for the heavyweight processing, right? You can still do, you know, basic cleaning, basic, you know, drop column operations within Airflow, but use the proper tools for actually, you know, and use more heavy compute like Spark provides to actually run your heavyweight data transformations. And it doesn't need to be Spark. It could also be something like running your DBT transformations within Snowflake um, or using a dedicated Python virtual environment that you have running that's a lot, uh, you know, a lot larger or a dedicated worker queue. Um, really a lot of options, but just make sure that in general, you want to avoid doing heavyweight lift processing in Airflow and instead push it out to external systems when possible like Spark. Now the next thing you want to avoid, and this is a really basic one, but something I see uh, happening all the time is avoid using any kind of definition of variables within your Airflow environment or within your Airflow DAGs itself. Um, number one, this is going to just be not safe, really. You know, anyone that can expose your DAG code is going to have that sensitive data like API keys, like file paths, uh, connection strings. Instead, use Airflow variables, use connections, use secret backends. There's a ton of different tools for securely managing these. And while it might be really easy to just hard code your, you know, your password or API key in for some testing, it's never something you want to go to production with. And it's also going to increase the latency for uh, processing your DAG processor because it's going to need to generate all these variables every time it, it iterates through the DAG. Um, so not only is it insecure, it's also going to impact your performance. Now, the next mistake I see people make is building massive monolithic DAGs. Um, especially, you know, some people are coming from legacy schedulers where they might want to build one massive pipeline that has hundreds and hundreds of tasks in it. It's generally not a great idea. Um, number one, it makes it really hard to troubleshoot. And number two, if something goes wrong, um, and you know, obviously Airflow allows you to restart from a given task, but potentially, you know, if, if it's something that is time sensitive, right? Uh, if one task fails, uh, it's gonna be really hard to troubleshoot what that task was, number one. Um, and then also fixing any downstream inputs, you know, if it had any kind of degree of parallelism, uh, making sure certain branches run and certain don't. It's a lot easier if you have modular pipelines that you link together through Airflow data sets um, and also use things like task groups and dynamic task mapping to avoid just, you know, creating tons and tons of individual tasks that are unorganized within a DAG. You know, sometimes you are going to have a large degree of tasks in a DAG. That's when task groups are useful for helping to organize and break them up. So it isn't just one massive stream of tasks that's really hard to untangle uh, within the DAG code itself, right? Because hundreds of tasks is going to be thousands of lines of DAG code. Um, and if you don't have that properly organized, it's going to be just a mess to try and troubleshoot and also just to maintain. Now, the next thing you're going to want to think about is not manually duplicating tasks and using dynamic task mapping. 
So this is a really great feature within Airflow that allows you to give an array to a task um, and then use the dot .expand method to create, uh, in this case, three map task instances, so three instances of process file uh, with for each of those three files, so you can process them in parallel. Before, people would do things like, hey, I have one prep file and I'm gonna either override it or I'm gonna create three different manual task instances of this, which was just annoying, ton of boilerplate code, super annoying to maintain, um, and really hard to troubleshoot as well. Versus this is, number one, a lot easier to maintain code, less boilerplate code, but it also has more dynamism. You know, This array could change dynamically, and this task, amount of these processing file tasks would change dynamically with it, rather than if this array changed, this entire DAG would fail because there wouldn't be the right amount of, of uh, tasks for the amount of files being generated. Um, so really, really useful feature, and, and everyone should be using it. Now, another kind of, I guess, un, really lesser known feature of Airflow is the ability to you know, use pools to actually segment your DAGs. Um, and instead of just having one global queue where you might be overloading a particular worker, um, you actually can say, hey, I have priority DAGs or priority pools where more important DAGs will always get scheduled as quickly as possible while the rest of your DAGs can use a general queue. Um, this is, I'd say, less something that you, know, you should avoid and just more something that people don't really know about that much. Um, and so being able to incorporate this in eliminates a lot of the common problems where you know, I'll have really important DAGs and they not, might not get scheduled as quickly as I want them. That's where you can use this to make sure that your priority DAGs will always get scheduled as quickly as possible. Now, the next tip is an easy one. Make sure you're always implementing retries, retries, delays, uh, and an execution timeout, okay? These are really great for, you know, if you have a task and it fails because of some kind of just, you know, glitch in the system where a file didn't arrive in time, retries are a great way to avoid unnecessary errors, unnecessary alerts, and just retry that. Obviously, you know, having something arrive or be alerted on six minutes after it uh, fail or after it initially fails might be a problem in some use cases, but in most use cases, it's going to help cut down on the amount of alert fatigue you experience and make sure that, you know, kind of basic errors that would have been caught by just restarting the task are automatically caught rather than requiring someone to go in there and restart it manually. Now, another thing, another uh, best practice, and I'd say tip you, you know, for things that you don't want to, you, things you want to avoid, um, is abusing, you know, schedules like daily or hourly. Um, you know, these are great utility functions, um, but for large businesses, especially, you know, if you're running airflow production, you want to have things like time zone awareness. And you also want to be able to know, like, hey, if this is running daily, um, when is that day going to be? Is it going to be Eastern? Is it going to be the Asian time zone? Um, it really depends, right? And so having, you know, in your global business, you might have DAGs that are globally distributed. Having that information available in the DAG is really crucial, right? So that someone doesn't have to track down the owner of the DAG to figure out when it's going to get run. Um, and also, you know, aligning, making sure reports are available on time is a lot easier if you know the exact time that a DAG is going to arrive, so then you can schedule any downstream processes to occur when that DAG finishes. Um, so just quality of life feature, you know, that you, it's a little bit more work, but something that I think is really useful um, for large enterprises. Obviously, if you're just a small team running Airflow, probably get away with daily and hourly because you're all gonna be running on the same day or time zone, but when you're a globally distributed team, that's when you wanna start bringing in time zones. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, kind of hand in hand with uh, my previous uh, question, or my previous thing on, on alerts and, and retries and timeouts and alert fatigue, is making sure you have alerts to give you fatigue in the first place. Um, so having alerts and notifier classes now within Airflow, where you can define global functions that you can easily apply to all of your DAGs, you know, through the alert on failure, just import a notifier. Um, but here you can define you know, your own logic, things like calling out to a Slack webhook, calling out to a Teams instance, um, and have those fire from your Airflow decks. Um, it's something that you know, I think a lot of people overlook because they're like, oh, you know, you'll just go and monitor your Airflow DAGs uh, within the UI, but that's really a pain in the ass when you're you know, running hundreds of DAGs. So this is a much better way to automate that process and only get the alerts on the DAGs that you actually need to, or actually go you know, troubleshoot and avoid you having to go into the UI unless there's something for you to troubleshoot. So really helping to save a lot of time in managing airflow. Um, and you can also structure these messages to have all the pertinent information actually appear to you in the alert itself, helping to cut down on the time resolution too. Now, another best practice and tip you're gonna, you know, something I find a lot of people don't do is build DAG tests. Um, there's a lot of basic kind of PI tests that you can incorporate into uh, your testing framework. You can use the Airflow CLI, you can use the Astro CLI, 
a lot of different ways to bring in tests to uh, not only test, hey, does this DAG going to import correctly, but also does it have things like tags? Does it have retry set to make sure that you are adhering to DAG best practices um, and not allowing you know, developers to push bad code because you're making it go through these necessary processes? Um, so that's another really you know, kind of top tip, I would say. Um, and then finally, my, my final piece of it, you know, thing I see people not doing is not upgrading Airflow. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen people running Airflow 1.x, which is some, a software that was deprecated in 2020, um, so five years down the road. And it's, if you fall be so far behind in upgrading, it's just going to become more and more painful to actually upgrade when you need to. Um, and there is going to become a point where you're going to need to upgrade. Um, and you should want to as well. There's so many additional great features in Airflow 3.0 that you can take advantage of, and even Airflow 2.0 if you're on Airflow 1, um, that make it run fast, that make it perform better, make it easier to use. Um, and by just not upgrading, you're holding yourself back. Um, so as scary as it might be to make that first step, it's really important to maintaining a long-term healthy Airflow environment. So those are all the tips I wanted to kind of bring some awareness to and help people avoid. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data Guy out.